Good evening, everyone. I'm Sylvia Liska, president of the Friends of the Secession, and I'm delighted to introduce Emmeline Butterfield Rosen this evening as our distinguished guest speaker. I first heard of Emmeline in 2016 through Peter Curry, a dear mutual friend. He praised her as the charismatic individual and superb scholar she is, and mentioned that she was just writing a book about Seurat, Nijinsky, and Klimt's Beethoven Fries. My interest, of course, was piqued. Looking into her biography, I was truly impressed. Her academic journey from studies at Columbia to earning a PhD from Princeton has led her to a position at the Williams Graduate Program of the Clark Institute. Since September this year, she has joined the faculty of the renowned Institute of Art at, at New York University. Congratulations. You bring the age group of that institution down by a lot. <laughs> In 2022, her essay with the intriguing title, Men Are Dogs, made the front page of the contemporary journal Art Forum, a notable achievement for a text on Titian. Yet this unconventional choice made perfect sense, as Emmeline extends her rigorous scholarship far beyond late century, 19th century art, her core specialty. By interweaving histories of art, art criticism, psychology, linguistics, and biology with theories of representation of gesture and corporal expression, her insights are both original and decidedly contemporary. With her stellar reputation, it comes as no surprise that her book, Modern Art and the Remaking of Human Disposition, was met with eager anticipation and has since gained international acclaim. I recommend that book to everyone. The Beethoven Frieze, located in the basement of the secession, was created by the first president of the Artists' Association, Gustav Klimt. It serves as a foundation of our institution. Contrary to prevailing popular opinion, Emmeline Butterfield Rosen positions Klimt's iconic frieze not necessarily as a tribute to Max Klinger's Beethoven monument, but situates it within a critical context, heralding it at the very beginning of modernity of 20th century art. As we are celebrating the session's 125th jubilee, Emmeline's lecture is the perfect birthday gift for our institution. Many thanks to you for this. And now, we are so eager to hear you, Emmeline. Please, everyone, join me in extending a warm welcome. Thank you so much for that kind, really kind introduction, Sylvia. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be with you to celebrate the 125th anniversary of the secession. And I, I must thank Sylvia Liska and the Friends of the Secession for the invitation to speak on this historic occasion. I am really humbled and excited to address the topic of Klimt's Beethoven Fries, which is, I think, quite literally the crown jewel of the secession and a work that has also been very important for my own intellectual journey as an art historian. I, and I need to locate the slide clicker. Thank you. Um, so I, I distinctly remember during the celebration of Klimt year in 2012, when I was still a doctoral student spending hours examining the Beethoven frieze up close on the bright yellow elevated platform built by the artist Gerwald Rockenschau. And my shock really at encountering this strange and vivid mural, these jewels encrusted into the bare wall, these thousands of eyes staring back at me, almost daring me to try to understand or explain them, started me on a research path that took many years to travel and which involved many surprises 
along the way. And I imagine that all of you as Viennese must know Klimt's Fries very well. I also know I am speaking in the hometown of many distinguished Klimt scholars whose research stands at the foundation of my own work, Marian Bizon's Prakin, Tobias Natter, among many others. So my goal for this evening, then, is to reveal a familiar object in new light. I will emphasize some previously unremarked sources of the Frieza's imagery, but more important, I hope to demystify the logic that organizes the mural formally. For in its own very mad way, the Beethoven Frieze is actually a very logical work, as I hope you will see. And to unpack this logic, I'm going to range quite widely to set Klimt in relation to a number of other artists beyond the immediate Vienna 1900 milieu. And that is because the formal logic that concerns me in the Beethoven Frieze is best understood as part of a much wider dynamic that is visible across European art at the turn of the 20th century, in which we see the scrambling of inherited visual codes for presenting the human body, giving material form to new ideas of what it means to be human. So the analysis of the Beethoven Frieze that I'll share with you this evening is drawn from my recent book, Modern Art and the Remaking of Human Disposition. And this book attempts to demonstrate how modern understandings of human genealogy and the human psyche, modern psychological understandings in the general family of those that blossomed here in Vienna around 1900, took visual form through the specific formal mechanism of bodily posture. And my insight into this relationship began with a very simple formal observation. I noticed that in the decades around 1900, across a range of practices, a new paradigm for posing figures emerged. Artists began to present human figures in strictly frontal, lateral, and dorsal postures. And I'm showing you here George Seurat's neo-impressionist manifesto painting, A Sunday on the Island of Grand Jatte, an early and particularly programmatic demonstration of formal strategies that became commonplace. So here we see the artist abolish oblique torsions along the central vertical axis of the body. We see all figures positioned frontally, that is either parallel or perpendicular to the support or the viewer. Seurat also de-emphasizes hands, feet, and limbs and employs the device of parallelism, orienting and posing multiple bodies in identical positions. And all of these strategies violate some of the most enduring and hallowed conventions for posing human bodies in the history of European art. Certain basic techniques of pose inherited from classical art and reinstated in the Renaissance period had held fairly constant in art over centuries, right up through the moment of Impressionism. The oblique rotation and ponderation of bodies and the variation of postures and gestures among different figures were recognized as indispensable to simulating the human being's corporeal volume, responsiveness to gravity, and capacity for autonomous thought and movement. And I'm showing you here an academy where students are training to learn this figural language alongside students draw student drawings by Seurat at bottom and on top by Klimt. The rejection of these inherited conventions of pose in, in modern artworks not only inaugurates certain visual properties that we now recognize as quintessentially modernist, it also manifests art's engagement with urgent epistemological questions of the period, such as what is thought and what are its limits? Is consciousness the defining feature of the species that named itself in 1758 Homo sapiens? And I realize that these are very broad statements. In the book, I particularize these claims by looking closely at three works that illuminate the stakes of this formal development. The first is the, the canvas poseuse, uh, painted by Seurat and first exhibited in 1888. The second is the one we are here to discuss today, Klimt's Beethoven Frieze, painted in 1902. And the third is the ballet Afternoon of a Fawn, danced and choreographed in 1912 by the Russian artist Vaslav Nijinsky. 
I chose these works because each makes clear how this new formal language of bodily postures responded to a set of preoccupations that had become urgent across turn of the century Europe. The motif of the animal, for instance, is more or less pivotal across all three works, and this animal presence reflects their embeddedness in a new imaginative terrain. This is the imaginative terrain opened by the intellectual historical event that Klimt's fellow Viennese Sigmund Freud referred to portentously in 1917 as the biological blow to human narcissism namely the recognition by the new field of evolutionary biology in the mid-19th century of the animal descent of the human species. Equally and inseparably, these works engage with the closely related development that Freud extolled as the psychological blow to human narcissism, the recognition of the unconscious dimensions of human mental life, which were scientifically observed, studied, and theatrically exposed in the late 19th century. Our focus this evening, of course, will be on Klimt, the birthday boy, the middle term of my investigation. And here is a preview of where we are going to end up. But to set up some terms from my discussion of the Beethoven frieze, I'll touch briefly on Seurat's Poseuse, which has a somewhat exemplary status for understanding the expressive valences of bodily pose in modern art. Pozos, as I understand it, is a commentary or a meditation that spells out the meaning of art's negation of inherited conventions of posing the body. This meditation was occasioned by the controversy sparked by Seurat's prior canvas, shown at the final Impressionist exhibition, where Seurat presented some 40 Parisians promenading on the banks of the Seine pose strictly de dos, de face, and de profil. And the Grand Jatte's novel manner of presenting figures provoked a major controversy, as the majority of viewers and writers condemned Seurat for having adopted an approach to the figure that was described as withholding exterior indications of the human being's inner soul or thought. To help specify formally why it was that Seurat's figures were regarded as evacuated of thought or consciousness, I turn to a body of writings just emerging in Seurat's period devoted to analyzing figuration in representational systems identified at this time as archaic, infantile, or primitive. A touchstone for my interpretation of modern art is an 1892 study by the Danish art historian Julius Lange, the representation of the human figure in its earliest period until the apogee of Greek art. In this little known but influential book, which introduced the term frontality into the lexicon of art history, Lange argued that a single development, the invention of a new type of pose in Greek sculpture in the fifth century BC, had, I quote him, strictly speaking, created European art. After scrutinizing a range of figural objects that Long termed primitive, including ancient Egyptian and Assyrian, as well as modern Oceanic and Native North American examples, he claimed to have detected a universal restriction governing the posture of the human figure in the art of all primitive cultures, which he christened the law of frontality. This law prohibited artists from introducing any torsion along the body's central vertical axis, demanding that figures be presented in attitudes in which a straight vertical line could be drawn down the torso to evenly bisect the figure. For Lange, Greek art of the 5th century BC was an advance of world historical import because artists broke with the law of frontality for the first time in history and in doing so, manifested a new conception of human interiority. By introducing the technique of incorporating oblique torsions and asymmetries in the pelvis, trunk, and neck of human figures, Long argued that Greek artists had found a method of corporeal presentation corresponding to a conception of a human being in whom, as he wrote, everything is directed and determined by an interior center an interior center that Long rendered in French as le moi, or the me. 
Seurat's Grand Jatte, as well as other works that employ strategies of frontality in this period, such as Klimt's Beethoven Frieze, need to be understood within the framework of assumptions and formal associations articulated by Lange. Because in the Grand Jatte, Seurat abandoned the technique of oblique posing that European viewers had been acculturated to seeing as bodying forth the inner moi, he was perceived to have voided soul and thought, presenting modern subjects as existing in a state of restricted consciousness. And although this formal technique provoked associations with so-called primitive art, it was also received in the context of highly contemporary preoccupations with hypnosis, somnambulism, and Darwinian theories of evolution that pervaded 1880s Parisian intellectual and popular culture, where there was profound interest in theories of mind that saw the role of conscious thought as radically circumscribed by unconscious and automatic instinctual impulses and in particular, unconscious imitative instinctual impulses. And in my book, I discuss at quite great length how the leashed pet monkey in the foreground of Grand Jatte, a very prim little counterpart to the Beethoven Frieze's toothy gorilla, uh, really condensed this constellation of associations. The idea of the human subject that is proposed in the Grand Jatte is deliberately withdrawn in Pozo's which goes back to the classical image of the human being that the Grand Jot had abandoned. In front of the portion of the picture containing the two figures, the standing woman and monkey, to which critics had responded with particular hostility, Seurat superimposed a trio of nude models in poses drawn from a classical canon. And I'm showing you here the agreed upon sources for the two peripheral seated models' poses. At the crux of my new interpretation is a new attribution of a source for the central model's pose. I suggest that this figure mimics a Hellenistic statue of the Greek orator Demosthenes that direct decorated the facade of Seurat's former school, the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. And crucially, this statue was renowned in the 19th century for its particularly arresting portrayal of contemplative intellect, of the, quote, exertion of thought, as one period archaeologist put it. And it's essential for what will come later in my discussion of Klimt that the gripping, clasped hands posture of the Demosthenes was seen as central to the impression of thoughtfulness given off by the sculpture. By quoting the Demosthenes posture in response to the Grand Jatte, Seurat seemed to pose the question of whether it was viable to return to a classical tradition of figural representation organized around the assumption that conscious thought was the human being's defining endowment. And I would say that the answer posed by Seurat is no, even if this is a bit of an ambivalent no. Through the figure of an adolescent female aping the Demosthenes pose, Seurat simultaneously summoned and obliterated the historically prized illusion of human thought, both by emphasizing the conventional artifice of pose as a trick of the studio, and also, I argue, by invoking an analogy that was commonplace in both medical and studio discourse in Paris at this moment, which was an analogy between the model's act of posing and a state of hypnotic trance. So Pozos can be seen to diagram the relationship between a new formal strategy of pose and a new epistemology of the human subject, which no longer presumes a fundamental distinction between animal and human nature, or relatedly that an alert, autonomous, or rational consciousness is the hallmark of the human. This new epistemology of the human subject is also the one that we can see playing out in Klimt's compositions, which are, of course, very different from Seurat's, but which share certain deep formal and iconographic affinities, particularly in the frieze, which brings together monkey imagery and an insistent primitivizing frontality of bodies, not to mention an emphasis on pointillism. And here I'm showing you details of surface, the Grand Jatte at left and Klimt at right, and you can see that dot-like shapes proliferate across the frieze's uh, plaster in the form of jewels, decorative patterning, not to mention stylized eye pupils. So with all this said, 
Let us move from Paris in the 1880s to Vienna at the dawn of the 20th century, and I will discuss the Beethoven Frieze in the context of its initial presentation in the spring of 1902 at the secession. This context is essential for understanding the most polemical propositions of Klimt's mural, which is really a polemic that narrates how this new epistemology of the human subject transforms the idea of the creative artist and the human aesthetic faculties. The Beethoven frieze was intended as an ephemeral dec decoration produced for the occasion of the so-called Klinger Beethoven exhibition, the most popular exhibition in the eight-year history of the secession. The event was a celebratory debut for a monumental statue of Ludwig von Beethoven just completed by the German artist Max Klinger after 17 long years of labor. And this massive work in precious stone and colored marbles had been inspired by Phidias's Cresaphalantine figure of Zeus from the temple at Olympia. It was installed at the center of the secession headquarters, which the 26 secessionists adorned with ephemeral wall decorations, Klimt's mural being by far the largest among them. Although art history has memorialized the Klinger Beethoven exhibition as a successful Art Nouveau Gesamtkunstwerk, my interest hinges instead on its internal contradictions. For there was, as I see it, an irreconcilable conflict in play in this collective enterprise of artistic hero worship. Although the secessionists promoted their exhibition as a, quote, temple ambiance for one who has become a god, for many viewers, seeing Beethoven in the claws of the secession, as one critic wrote, was like seeing something beloved and sublime dragged down into dust. The journalist Karl Krauss was particularly emphatic on this point. He stated that Klinger's statue exuded I, a, I quote, inner life of highest tension that was fundamentally incompatible with the environment that the secessionists had placed him in. Krauss singled out Klimt's frieze as the work responsible for trivializing Klinger's monument. Because the exhibition viewer had to pass through an antechamber adorned with Klimt's superficial allegories with their shallow materialistic punchlines, as Krauss put it, they necessarily would approach Klinger's statue with their, quote, soul and aesthetic perception poisoned. In what follows, I want to pursue the question of how Klimt's mural might have conveyed a materialist punchline that could be seen to poison the ideal of Beethoven figured in Klinger's sculpture. And in doing so, I will look at the Friese's iconography, particularly at its conclusion, but more importantly, I will look at how this iconography is folded into an approach to the presentation of bodies that seems almost to invert or reverse that of Klinger's sculpture, described by Krauss as conveying an inner life of highest tension. And it's just interesting also to note that this evident intellectual intensity of Klinger's figure was something that provoked certain turn-of-the-century archaeologists and classicists to actually compare it to the Demosthenes sculpture, which uh, Seurat quoted. <laughs> yeah. First conceived in 1885 during Klinger's sojourn in Paris, the Beethoven monument worked from within, or perhaps at the limit, of an inherited language of classically derived expressive gestures. It shares this feature with the sculpture many period viewers recognize to be its inspiration, Auguste Rodin's Thinker. Although Klinger's sculpture differs profoundly in terms of technique, Rodin's sculpture of a seated male nude, sculpted around 1880 as the poet Dante to crown the tympanum of the gates of hell, resonates with the Beethoven monument as an analogous effort to monumentalize a revered artist hero in the throes of contemplation in a form that appears to many today as it did already for certain viewers around 1900 as a visual cliche. And so for our purposes, what is relevant is that both works um, figure this state of contemplation by exploiting certain pre-existing corporeal conventions for expressing the inner activities of intellect, notably a clenched hand, a heavy head, and a seated posture. How he sits, one critic proclaimed of Klinger's sculpture. 
The whole figure is like that right hand's clenched fist, an expression of highest mental concentration. This observation that Beethoven's stooped body exhibits in every aspect of its posture the tension of this clenched fist, the exaggerated size of which was mocked in the popular press, underscores how Klinger's sculpture, like Rodin's thinker, hyperbolized the convention stretching back to antiquity for indicating intellectual exertion through a clenching or grasping hand gesture, which symbolized comprehension or catalepsis for the Stoic philosophers. The Stoic association of mental grasp and the human hand's prehensile capacity epitomizes one of the defining metaphors organizing our conception of thinking itself in Western culture. And this is the metaphor of understanding is grasping, something literalized in your German word begriff, begreifen, from the greifen. The critic's comparison of Klinger's body to a clenched fist recalls the description Rodin gave some years later of his thinker. What makes my thinker think is that he thinks not only with his brain, his knitted brow, distended nostrils, and compressed lifts, but with every muscle in his arms, back, and legs, with his clenched fist and gripping toes. Both Rodin and Klinger, in concert with their emphasis on the clenching disposition of the thinker, imparted to their sedentary figures a sense of weight and the downward pull of gravity. Both rendered contemplation by exploiting a metaphorical equivalence with deep roots in the European visual and linguistic imagination, and that is the the formal and symbolic conflation of physical and intellectual ponderation. Now to step back a moment, in the 19th century, the representation of the body's weight and relationship to gravity began to be conceptualized as foundational to the illusion of human consciousness as such. According to Long, this illusion was first created when Greek sculptures invented the interplay of Standbein and Spielbein, representing the shifting of weight from one foot to the other. So the rupture of the law of frontality is equivalent to the acknowledgement of bodily weight. Long has claimed that this single development, strictly speaking, created European art is grandiose and reductive, but it is certainly true that this postural innovation established a fundamental norm of Western figural representation, the norm of conveying the body's subjection to gravity by means of the technique referred to by artists such as Leonardo da Vinci as ponderazione, The normative function of ponderation in grounding, quite literally, the verisimilitude prized in European figuration has been emphasized in art history. What has been less explicit is the role played by ponderation in establishing consciousness as the normative mental disposition of the human figures enshrined within this regime of representation. The norm that figures should look lively and awake and not asleep, as Leonardo put it. So for instance, I believe that that in the Grand Jot, the somewhat floating, ungrounded aspect of the figures, resulting from Seurat's dramatic de-emphasis on feet and his frequent compacting of stance to a single column, was a central feature that provoked the widespread complaint that the figures seemed insufficiently alert, like sleepwalkers. Conventions for signifying not simply consciousness, but a specifically contemplative consciousness, build on that visual association between consciousness and corporeal gravity. And here it's essential that the verb ponder, as in to contemplate, derives from the verb ponder, as in to weigh. A work that beautifully plays with the metaphorical equivalence of these two senses is Albrecht Durer's Melancholia I. Here, Durer visualized a meditative state through a web of associations between weighing instruments, corporeal heaviness, and the downward pressure of gravity, presenting thought at once as a capacity for weighing and a visible weight dragging down the body. As we know from the study by Erwin Panofsky, Fritz Saxel, and Raymond Klebensky, Durer fused the figure of melancholy with a personification of the liberal art of geometry, identified in Durer's period with the mnemonic geoponderat, geometry ways. 
The scales appear in juror's print just adjacent to the head of the seated figure. The sense of heaviness imparted to this winged yet sedentary creature is compounded by the downward drip of sand in the hourglass hanging directly above her downcast head. Durer's print fuses two primary metaphors for mental activity identified by the linguists Mark Johnson and George Lakoff, mutually implicating the propositions considering is weighing and thought is the physical contents of the head. The activity of thinking as weighing manifests itself here concretely in the body, in the motif of the drooping head, as it was memorably termed by Panofsky and company. This drooping head motif, a conventional signifier for thought that endured in Western art over millennia, dating back to Greece in the early third century BC, found an archetypal formulation in Durer's Melancholia I, which went on to exert considerable influence on subsequent figurations of thinking as such, and the contemplation of artists more specifically. Rodin's thinker, whose head rests on his fist, propped up in turn by an elbow on the knee, operates firmly within this convention of visualizing intense intellectual activity by giving emphasis to the head's heaviness. Klinger's Klinger's Beethoven monument does also, if somewhat less overtly. The body of the sculpted composer appears, as one critic observed, bowed by its massive inclined head, which projects forward as if the neck would buckle beneath this enormous weight. Whether deployed to signify the rigors of thinking revered in ancient Greek culture or the conscious sorrow of a human being wrestling with intellectual problems, as Panofsky described Durer's figure, the drooping head cannot be described as a neutral motif. By the 19th century, the heavy head was a visual signature for self-congratulatory claims for the power of human intellect and the ways in which this mental endowment conferred upon human beings a privileged or even quasi-divine status. When, in 1906, a monumental thinker was erected outside the Paris Pantheon, an inaugural speech proclaimed that Rodin's sculpture would teach future generations, quote, the glory of thinking and the pride of being a man. The degree to which corporeal heaviness was structural to this heroic narrative about man as a being whose glory inhered in his unique capacity for mental cogitation finds summation in a quatrain that Arthur Simons composed as a hypothetical plaque for the enlarged thinker. Out of eternal bronze and mortal breath and to the glory of man, me Rodin wrought. Before the gates of glory and of death, I bear the burden of the pride of thought. The ideology of the burden of the pride of thought is even more emphatic in Klinger's sculpture, presenting the composer as a, quote, thought-sunken Zeus Beethoven, as one critic aptly described Klinger's sculpture, as a mortal human who has ascended to the summit of Mount Olympus on the basis of his highest mental concentration, This monument internalizes the metaphor of thought as ennobling heaviness even in its material structure. As one critic noted, ponderation is the essential quality of the Beethoven by Klinger. The sculpture's exorbitant weight, which was uh, around 4,000 kilograms, but at one point erroneously reported in the Viennese press to be 10,000 kilograms, was a topic of unceasing speculation in the popular press. Klinger's Beethoven betrays less ambivalence than its purported model about the unequivocally elevated status of thought activity. Rodin's remark that his thinker thinks not only with his brain, but also with his gripping toes, echoed in Rainer Maria Rilke's identification of the figure as the one who sits thinking with his entire body, emphasizes a mode of thinking that extends downwards. Indeed, Rodin's mode of signifying thoughtfulness with the entire body was recognized by certain viewers as a parody of the dignity of intellectual activity. 
The vaguely excremental effect of Rodin's figure, derided by certain period viewers as, a, I quote, a symbol of thought in the attitude of a constipated man exerting himself on a chamber pot, emblematizes how the thinker maintained a set of inherited conventions for signifying the pride of thought at the same time that it exceeded them, making blatant a set of grossly physical metaphors for the creative process that located thought less in the brain than in lower bodily functions that were, so to speak, productive. As Albert Elson has noted, the thinker was the last work for which Rodin relied upon what he called stock poses from art history. That departure finds vivid expression in the work that must be seen as the thinker's successor, Rodin's 1898 monument to Honoré de Balzac. The Balzac transformed the corporeal conventions employed in the thinker in a number of crucial aspects. Conceived from the first as a standing rather than seating figure, the Balzac took its final form from a study of the upright author standing headless with his right hand clenched around his erect penis, while the left hand supports the wrist as if helping to carry its enormous weight. In the final monument, Rodin cloaked the towering verticality of Balzac's body beneath a monk's robe that bulges distinctly in the groin area a fact acknowledged in numerous period caricatures of laughing crowds gazing up slack-jawed at the crotch of the sculpture. As a symbolic expression for Balzac's thought, the hand gripped around the genitals evokes yet transforms the clenched fist motif, while also displacing the locus of manual contact associated with the drooping head propped up on a fist or palm. Balzac's conceal, concealed but still conspicuous gesture can be seen to point with an almost pantomimic vividness to a physical and conceptual displacement of the locus of creative potency from above to below, from the head to the genitals. Further, and crucially, in the Balzac, that displacement is coupled with the repudiation of the metaphorical burden of the pride of thought expressed through the head's heaviness. As Rilke noted, Balzac's head appears to, quote, crown this figure like those spheres which dance upon the jets of fountains. Indeed, we could say, as Rilke declared of the Balzac, that all heaviness becomes light. A sense of weightlessness permeates the entire sculpture, descending from this head which dances like a ball on a spray of water down into a body that pitches precariously backwards, neatly inverting the posture of the thinker whose heavy head seems to drag the torso forward. Furthermore, the cloak of this Balzac dans un sac, as the press like to call the sculpture, completely obscures the feet that would support the weight of this figure, lending the whole body a floating aspect. This transition from a corporeal language of gravity to one of levity coincides with a new symbolic vocabulary for thought, one that we might describe as specifically ejaculatory. For if in the thinker thought was evoked by showing a, quote, head bent beneath the onus of an idea, in the Balzac, as, one, as another critic wrote, thought is the lava that erupts from this human volcano. <laughs> Rodin's Balzac, as an inversion of the corporeal metaphorics of the thinker, provides a model for comprehending Klimt's response to the Beethoven by Klinger when he was tasked with creating a temporary mural to accompany, accompany the debut of the sculpture. It must be emphasized that well before the Klinger Beethoven exhibition, Klimt had already rejected the conventions that Klinger was still employing to signify and dignify human contemplation. And we can see this in the genesis of his philosophy, the first of the three sadly now destroyed allegories that he painted between 1894 and 1907 for the Vienna University. So in reworking his preliminary sketch for philosophy, Klimt abandoned his plan to present the allegorical figure of knowledge propping up her head against the downward force of gravity, seated in a pose that the art historian Alice Strobel argued was modeled on Rodin's thinker. 
the new form Klimt gave to the figure of knowledge was as associated by the cultural historian Karl Shorsky with the midnight singer in Friedrich Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra, an association that Shorsky left at the level of things in the air, but which was apparently inspired by what the historian described as the figure's challenging frontality. Leaving aside the question of any direct influence of Nietzsche on Klimt, a very deep connection can be drawn between the philosopher and the painter on the basis of their mutual rejection of the conventional pose of contemplation. In the words of Gilles Deleuze, Nietzsche was the historical figure who initiated a, quote, new image of thought, overthrowing its dogmatic image. While with this phrase, Deleuze meant to convey that Nietzsche reconceptualized philosophy as a vocation, rejecting the presumption that truth was its object or that its mission could be com com compromised by the body, passions, and sensuous interests, Deleuze's notion of a new image of thought also corresponds far more concretely to Nietzsche's rejection of the dogmatic pose of contemplation. Nietzsche frequently railed against the received wisdom that, as Gustave Flaubert put it, one can only think while sitting. Flaubert's seemingly banal observation, quoted in Nietzsche's Twilight of the Idols, incited the philosopher to proclaim that sitting down or sedentariness, dat sitz Fleisch, is the true sin against the Holy Spirit. Thoughts produced while sitting, the philosopher insisted, always betray the, quote, cramped intestines, the eagerness, seriousness, and rage of the thinker who thought them. Nietzsche himself, who, through the mouth of Zarathustra, preached a dogma in which all heaviness becomes light, claimed to do his own thinking only while standing up, or walking, jumping, climbing, or dancing. In other words, he claimed to do his thinking precisely not in the pose in which he was figured in this 1904 sculpture or in this photograph taken early in his career. Instead, in Zarathustra and elsewhere, Nietzsche declared himself the enemy of the spirit of gravity or Geist der Schwere. This antipathy was structural to his attack on the mind-body hierarchy established by a human species that was inclined to regard itself, as he put it, as not an animal, but at best some sort of co cogital. Kein animal, sondern höchstens ein cogital. Nietzsche delighted in mocking the stock metaphors of grasp and gravity invoked by viewers in front of statues like Klinger's Beethoven and Rodin's Thinker, metaphors that had been conventionalized in European culture in part through figural imagery, as Nietzsche was surely aware. We know, for instance, that he was familiar with Dürer's Melancholia I in 1869. It was his Christmas gift to Cosima Wagner, and it's tempting to imagine Nietzsche recalling Durer's print 10 years later when, as a changed man, he composed the aphorism, Man as Measurer. The polemical thrust of this maxim was essentially to de-metaphorize ponderation, to insist that humanity's conception of its own capacity for mental reflection the source of its self-identity and inflated self-regard had its derivation in the highly concrete discovery of measures and measuring, scales and weighing. Nietzsche's unmasking of humanity's most treasured and allegedly metaphysical endowment as merely a physical operation was a key tactic in his attack on the so-called Geist der Schwere, for this unmasking undermined the human tendency to value thought on the basis of its presumed heaviness or difficulty, which is, of course, the crucial double sense of Schwere here. It was Nietzsche's great antipathy to the chain of associations leading from thought as weighing to thought as noble burden that provoked him to deride the dogmatic pose of seated contemplation, manifest in works such as those by Durer, Rodin, and Klinger. In Nietzsche's writings, the venerable figure of the seated, burdened thinker is recast or unmasked in scatological terms as a figure for poor digestion and more specifically for the affliction of constipation. And here we might take note of the potential presence in Melancholia I of a clyster or enema syringe poking out from beneath the skirt of the seated figure. 
Constipation, in Nietzsche's acerbic aphorisms, was the physical correlate to a metaphorics of thought conceived in terms of heaviness, struggle, or effort. And forgive me in advance for what I am about to show you here, but I regard it as symptomatic of a crisis in the dogmatic image of thought around the turn of the century that this implicit metaphorics began to take on new explicitness and blatancy. And here we have two period caricatures, one with the charming Kikiriki rooster proffering Klinger's Beethoven with a liquid laxative above the caption, this man can be helped, and another... <laughs> and another where his thrones puti hold their noses and point downwards above the caption, Ah, master, great is the torment, in vain your efforts. Klimt's rejection of the initial pose for the figure of knowledge in philosophy, I want to suggest, betrays an impulse analogous to Nietzsche's, an impulse to reject a dogmatic image of thought conceived in terms of a spirit of gravity. So what characterizes the new image of thought Klimt conceived to replace it in philosophy? If previously Klimt relied upon Sitzfleisch and the drooping head, his new personification of knowledge abandons suggestions of weight and effort. A frontal head with an expressionless gaze hovers at the bottom of the canvas echoed by a large sphinx's head that congeals from the sparkling ether of the background their parody emphasizing a sense of upward surge. This revised picture of philosophy introduced what would become a key visual trope in Klimt's art and what I, a key visual trope in Klimt's art, what I will call the motif of the levitating head. And as we will see, this motif of the levitating head reemerges in a key position in the Beethoven frieze. It is a truism in the literature on the frieze that in this work, Klimt succeeded in powerfully evoking an unconscious realm of life or the functioning of the drives in the unconscious mind, to quote the art historian Joseph Kerner. And I do not wish to contest that very fundamental observation, but rather to specify how Klimt evoked these mental properties. And as I will try to show you through the remainder of my remarks tonight, Klimt evoked an unconscious realm of life by using formal mechanisms that systematically reverse the corporeal metaphors of grasp and gravity at the level of his treatment of depicted figures and more generally through the frieze's material properties. I will not enter into the considerable intricacies of the Frieze's allegorical program, which loosely follows the narrative arc of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. I will just focus on the concluding section where Klimt represented the Ode to Joy, the fourth and final movement of the symphony, where he, he allegorized this fourth movement as a sort of representation of humanity's salvation through art. This final section of the mural appeared just after a break in the wall decoration where the viewer was able to see the Beethoven monument beneath Klimt's frieze. Before I turn to the final section, I just want to emphasize that this final section culminates an overall decorative program in which Klimt deploys the repeating forms of female figures with eyes closed as if in trance or sleep the 20 personifications of humanity's longing for happiness that traverse nearly the full length of the mural, and the 16 figures uh, composing the choir of paradise angels at the Frieze's conclusion. And in these figures, Klimt evokes an unconscious realm of life not only through the conventional sign of closed eyes, but also corporeally through an overall suggestion of physical levity and through his treatment of hands and feet. The rhythmic repetition of the longing for happiness figures whose heads all point, point right towards the conclusion of the mural create a propulsive horizontal vector running the width of the mural, like almost like a long arrow that points us to the frieze's concluding climax. Their prone and supine bodies stretch out horizontally and are swaddled in feet encasing shroud-like sacks. In the more prominent of the two variations, the arms reach out with downward facing palms and the heads are surrounded by graphic discs of brown hair that some critics saw as life preservers. Um, each head appears detached from the body. They look to me like the empty holes of a donut. Um, and at the same time, 
they propel the allegorical narrative towards its climax, but these longing for happiness figures also reiterate the mural's materiality and its position in the room, hovering overhead at the top edge of the mural. This recursive relationship is underscored in the merging of their skin with the bare plaster wall. This calls attention to one of the most innovative formal characteristics of the frieze, which is actually its strategic use of empty, unfilled space, with bare plaster making up more than half of the mural's surface area. In the longing for happiness figures, this emptiness of these literally hollow bodies renders them in a state of levitation or flotation, what might be described as swimming in air. Klimt's corporeal overturning of the Geist der Schwere in these figures is reiterated in the choir of angels framing the Friese's final section. Here, Klimt overturns the metaphors of grasp and gravity very literally with his treatment of hands and feet. Look at the distinctive gesture visible in the first row of angels, both palms cupped open and turned outwards with little rosebuds held between the thumb and index fingers. Like Beethoven's closed fist, this gesture clearly communicates an inner mental state, but it does so by inverting the convention deployed in Klinger sculpture. If a fist squeezed tightly around itself to expel any pockets of air functioned for European art as a symbol for intellectual grasp and effort, within the logic of that convention, the opening of the palm like an empty cup and the framing of a circular void of space between the thumb and index finger might effectively suggest an antithetical psychic condition as the absence of conscious or intentional thought. And I believe that's how the gesture functions here, especially given its potential allusion to Buddhism through its seeming approximation of the Vitarka Mudra. Klimt was almost surely ignorant of uh, the actual theological significance of this finger posture, which communicates teaching, exposition of laws, and argumentation. His borrowing of the mudra is obviously informed by the gestural conventions of his own culture, as well as Western culture's growing tendency to turn, in the, at the turn of the century, to associate Buddhism with unconscious dimensions of the psyche that had been discovered by modern science. Um, so these are meditating figures in the modern uh, wellness sense of the word. Klimt's turning upside down of the metaphor of thinking as grasping through the angel's open hand gesture works in tandem with an overturning of the metaphor of thought as weight. The heads of these angels who gesticulate the Vitarka Mudra, framed by disks of hair that transform their heads into ball-like spheres, appear to levitate towards the ceiling, drawing their bodies upwards. Their toeless feet dangle down directly parallel to the wall's vertical plane, superimposed over a carpet-like expanse of grass that extends from above their heads to beneath their feet. Within the frame of these levitating, meditating angels unburdened from gravity, Klimt presents the mural's climax. To conclude, I want to focus on a striking but rarely discussed motif that appears in this final vignette. A motif of the levitating head that, I will argue, presents itself as the externalization of the invisible creative thoughts weighing down on the sculpted Beethoven visible in the adjacent hall. And here it's relevant that the sculpture was widely perceived as rendering Beethoven in a specific moment, the moment when he is meditating on the composition of his greatest work, the Ninth Symphony. In the conclusion of the Beethoven frieze, which pictures lines from the Ode to Joy, be embraced you millions, this kiss for all the world, Klimt countered the sculpture's image of a drooping, thought-sunken head for a motif of the levitating head. And Klimt deployed this motif of the levitating head in a manner quite closely related to Rodin's treatment of the upper extremity in the Balzac where the lightness of a head that Rilke analogized to a ball dancing on a spray of water is linked with an overarching sexualization of the theme of creative contemplation. At the base of a large gold oval superimposed over the repeating pattern of levitating angels, Klimt depicts the roots of a rose bush branching upwards, supporting a series of successively narrowing uterine forms. 
A solid gold phallic column extends up the center of the nested ovals. Within it, Klimt enclosed two naked bodies pressed against one another in an embrace that evokes penetrative coitus. Decidedly not a kiss in the sense to which Beethoven's lyrics would seem to have alluded. Hovering over this couple, we find the Frieze's oddest, most striking detail, as well as its most insistent moment of pure frontality. I refer to the pair of gold discs with schematic facial features. features. To us, they appear like two archaic emojis suspended over the naked couple. These forms are typically described as symbols of the sun and moon, echoing the cosmic decorative themes of other secessionist contributions to the decorative program. But I would suggest that these sun and moon forms also, and more importantly, bear an earthly, specifically biological significance. Preliminary sketches reveal the willfulness with which Klimt decapitated his kissing couple. The frieze preserves only the merest indication that these human bodies possess um, anything above the neck. By rendering the figures virtually headless, Klimt forces the viewer to perceive the two subtly gendered facial discs suspended over the naked male and female bodies as detached substitutes floating above for their absent heads. These faces can be seen as registering the aesthetic rapture of two listeners hearing the final movement of the Ninth Symphony. Or if we read the Frieze's naked man as a proxy for Beethoven at the triumphant conclusion of his quest to compose the Ninth Symphony, the floating head at left can be seen as externalizing Beethoven's mental state as he realizes his most revered creation. And I think this reading is is emphasized by the fact that the head hovering over the male body is the one with eyes open. Although Klimt's paired presentation of closed and open eyes here and throughout the frieze deliberately confounds or negates any conventional opposition between states of sleep and waking consciousness, Here, the open eyes of the face above the male figure evokes a sense of rapt awakening to an inner dream vision. The pure frontality of these discs brings to a formal summa, a broader association I have been stressing in the frieze between the formal elimination of ponderation and obliquity and the visual cancellation of consciousness. The facial discs are like two punctuation marks that terminate the Frieze's overall association between an emancipation from gravity and a state of release from the metaphorical burden, the specifically human and prideful burden of thought. And the formal features of these levitating gold faces also correspond to the comprehension of art as embedded in unconscious instinctual functions narrated throughout the Frieze. As scholars have noted, the wall where Klimt depicts the hostile powers is saturated with visual allusions to evolutionary theory, dominated almost entirely by a figure identified in the catalog as the giant Typhon. This wall presents the fiercest monster of Greek mythology in the form departing markedly from ancient description, namely as a gorilla with with feathered wings and snake tails. This gorilla is integrated into a highly sexualized area of decorative patterns consisting of stylized gold phalli and quasi-vaginal triangles in various sizes and colors along with feathers and jeweled adornments. Above all, the wall's decoration makes insistent allusions to Darwin's highly controversial theory of sexual selection in The Descent of Man a theory that held that the taste for the beautiful was shared by animals and derived from mate selection, so that, as as one uh, period writer glossed Darwin, the aesthetic sense is in last resort a secondary characteristic common to all sentient beings, be they pigs or philosophers, saints or starfish. The facial discs floating above the kissing couple materialize this relocation of the aesthetic from the domain of higher faculties to the kinds of lower passions shared by pigs and philosophers. There is a distinct 
suggestion of facial fur in the pattern encroaching on both faces, especially conspicuous in the face hovering over the male figure. Both resemble illustrations of New World monkeys contained in an illustrated volume Klimt kept in his library, which he certainly consulted in composing the figure of Typhon. And indeed, I think Klimt creates a direct visual connection between Typhon and the gold monkey face above uh, the male figure through the shape of their rounded bug eyes and through the black dot of pupil which Klimt carefully drew onto the mother of pearl eyes of Typhon. Other evolutionary illusions here substantiate a reading of the levitating faces as deliberately simian in aspect. The branching rose bush that encloses and obscures the feet of the naked couple evokes Darwin, Darwin's arboreal diagram of diversification by genealogical six, descent, which was extrapolated by Heckel in phylogenetic trees. And notably, the levitating heads attached to this genealogical tree with what have been described as comet's tails, which wriggle downwards to meet the base of the tree. But again, astronomical symbolism merges with the biological. These comets' tails attach to two heads that push from the exterior into a large ovum-like form suspended above the couple also plainly resemble the tails of sperm. And I'm showing you here illustration, illustrations from Heckel, which Klimt clearly could have seen. So what I'm identifying as Klimt's invention here is admittedly quite outrageous. At the close of the frieze, Klimt presents two floating, frontal, ornamental, monkey-faced heads of sperm suspended in a moment of fertilization to evoke the mental states of a man and woman experiencing the Ninth Symphony or to evoke Beethoven's own mental state in the moment when the Ninth Symphony takes shape in the composer's imagination. This, perhaps, is the shallow materialist punchline Karl Krauss identified as having poisoned his encounter with Klinger's sculpture at the Klinger Beethoven exhibition. The terms on which Beethoven was celebrated in Klinger's sculpture were spectacularly negated in Klimt's mural which offered, as I have tried to suggest, a new image of thought as well as a new basis for idolizing the human artist. Not as the pondering god that Klinger celebrated, but rather an individual, or we could say a male individual, with a facility for accessing and publicly representing unconscious or instinctual sexual impulses. And of course, it's not irrelevant that Klimt, much like Rodin, really lived out publicly the sexual script implied in his frieze. More than a dozen illegitimate children were fathered by the creator of, this levit of these levitating monkey sperms. Um, a well-known photograph of Klimt posing inside the Klinger Beethoven exhibition on the eve of its opening suggests that Klimt and his colleagues knew pretty well how the contemplative ideal of the artist upheld by Klinger and Beethoven, uh, which they were ostensibly celebrating, would be eclipsed by the new one embodied by Klimt. Klimt sits in the main hall of the exhibition, directly facing the Beethoven monument in one of two armchairs the secession is specially designed for the exhibition. The half-human, half-reptilian finials of the secessionist throne clearly mimics the puti that in Klinger's monument point at the drooping head of Beethoven. Klimt assumes the seat, wearing his signature painting kaftan, for Klimt always painted dans un sac, much like Rodin's Balzac. His face framed between the animal finials, the painter holds his head erect and turned frontal to the camera, making an expressionless face that almost recalls the one he gave to the blank face of knowledge in philosophy. Invoking while also transforming the model of the deified artist embodied in the sculpture across the room from him, Klimt in this photograph announces the coronation of a new image of thought around the turn of this 20th century, when the throne of a pondering god of thunder could be usurped by an art artist who identified himself to play on the terms of Nietzsche as not a cogital, but at best, some sort of animal. Thank you.
Thank you, dear Emmeline. None of us will ever look at the Crimp Feast the same as we did before. <laughs> and we're opening for questions from the audience, if there are any. Yes. So, thank you so much for this great talk, uh, which sort of also just reminded all the people that also already read your book of sort of how it just comes together so excellently. Um, so thank you so much for this. Um, I have a sort of a totally new question that just popped up while listening to your talk um, that I, I've never, I haven't thought about this before when I was reading your book. And the question is that um, whether there is a notion of overthinking like as a as a version of how the the weight of thinking the burden of thinking can sort of um result in a failure of carrying this burden that could be described and as a sort of because there has been overthinking and the reason why i started wondering about this is because to me it seems that uh, the beethoven um, klinger's beethoven monument has really some sort of aspects of uncanniness and monstrosity to it, that it might sort of also be sort of read as a, as a or sort of a symbol of what happens if you overthink. Uh, it also, both in terms of what is represented, but also in terms of what Klinger did, in the, terms of how long he took. And that again, you know, if you think there's, there's this trope in the 19th century, uh, sort of starting from Balzac with uh, the chef d'oeuvre inconnu to sort of uh, Claude, Lantier, de, uh, Claude Lantier's demise in Solas L'Oeuvre, sort of two painters that by way of overthinking what they are doing, they end up creating monstrosities that can't be understood. So did you come across any reflections in terms of overthinking? I mean, thank you so much, David. Um, I think that's, yes, I mean, I think I came across it really in, in Nietzsche's writing. I mean, he, I think he would say, if I might stand in for him, that <laughs> that is the, the, the entire problem of the entire paradigm of thinking as effort and or thinking as heaviness, that it kind of just inherently leads to overthinking and that that kind of is what collapses the whole system. So he, so Nietzsche says, a thought comes when it wants, not when I want. Es denkt. Um, so effort actually cancels any possibility for progress for, for someone like Nietzsche. And I think the, the time investment, the, the physical and financial investment, this, this sculpture basically... Um, almost bankrupted Klinger. Um, he, he spent his personal fortune kind of placing jewels on this. Um, it, it's emblematic of this overness, this... Yes, and, and I think that's exactly right. I never thought of the word overthinking, but I think it's, it's really helpful that this model of thought as effort necessarily leads to a kind of excessiveness. Thank you. Yeah, thank you from my side for that brilliant and very instructive talk too. What I was thinking about, is, um, what you didn't mention, and I don't know whether you mentioned that in the book, but I don't remember it, is when I was uh, looking again at the fur of the monster and the mm. textiles, whether there is some kind of, re or could be some kind of reverberation with uh, Alois Riegel's distinction between clear and uh, distant vision that he referred back to Adolf Hildebrandt in order to distinct between the haptic space, the text, text uh, yeah, the, the texture of the surface and at the same time of modern painting. Does that probably make any sense to also think about because it was at that time when he published 
his theory. That's so interesting. No, I hadn't thought of that at all. The, the way in which I, ha- I was understanding Regal in, in the book is, is basically some, a, a more basic point, just that, you know, in Stielfragen, the, the idea that the urge to decorate and that ornament be- comes, comes before any utility and kind of art as a primal drive. And, and of course, there's a lot of connections one could draw between the secessionists and Regal. But, but the idea of texture and near seeing that, that I had not thought of, and I think it's really brilliant. I mean, the fur is really, really interesting. I think in my book, I definitely didn't do enough with the fur, the scales, the, all of the ways in which the whole frees. Because if you think about the, the bare plaster is equated with the skin, of the floating longing for happiness figures and then the on the hostile powers wall it's basically just fur and snakeskin so the whole freeze is like a skin and of course skin is the most tactile part of the body and and obviously it's very textured you want to touch it um i have to think more about that but i think it's very fruitful thank you Thank you.